Okay. And I think that sounded like was that top <laughs> right. <laughs> that is chair. I've just muted him while he's um. <laughs> well done. Um, okay, morning, morning, everyone. Morning, members. Morning, members of the public. Nice, nice to see you, Councillor Yeoman. Um, uh, yes. So we'll start the meeting. Um, before I start the meeting, just to run through the procedures for each meeting for those members of the public that may be watching it on on YouTube. Um, what we'll do is, is that. Each, each application will be presented by the planning officer. Uh, we will then have speakers on that. So that can be an objector, a supporter, the parish council, and then the local ward members. After each of those, has, the, those individuals have spoken and they get three minutes, uh, uh, then members of the committee are in a position to ask them questions. Um, after those questions have been taken, we will then move into the debate uh, and members will debate it. And after the debate, we'll have a proposal and a seconder uh, and then we will vote on that particular application. Um, just remind members that we are live streamed. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's just a reminder. Um, and initially, before we start the meeting, we will just take a roll call. Um, I think that's Miss Young will take the roll call just to check that we're quorum and that those that everyone's there. Just to remind you, please do concentrate on all applications. I know we've just got the one today, um, but uh, to make sure that you give it your full attention. Right. Um, I think that's it. Uh, just before we start, then, um, Miss Young, over to you. If you could do a roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Abbott. My apologies. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Councillor Brazil. Present. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Present. Thank you, Councillor Foss. Present. Thank you, Councillor Hodgson. Present. Thank you, Councillor Holway. I'll come back to Councillor Holloway. Councillor Kemp. Present. Thank you. Councillor Long. Present. Thank you. Councillor Callahan. Good morning, Janice. <laughs> Councillor Pringle. Present. Councillor Rowe. Present. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Present. And can I go back to Councillor Holloway, please? Present. Sorry about Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, that's uh, all present and correct. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Young. And, and sorry, I should have said welcome to Denise. Um, nice to see you standing in for, for Councillor Panel. Um, I think I the right meeting, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that. Famous last words. Uh. <laughs> right. We shall now just just as, a, as another aside. I mean, obviously, members, uh, I can, I can see quite a few of you here. Try and remain uh, at the very least muted while you're not speaking, just so that we um, you don't pick up, pick up any, any unfortunate background. Um, and if members want to, you know, quite happy for you to come off um, the camera uh, when you're not speaking, because sometimes that can lead to distortion for everyone else. Um, but it seems to be OK as we are at the moment. Right. Let's move into the agenda then. So item one to approve the minutes as the correct record of the meeting held on the 6th of January 2021. Uh, are, you, are you all content with that? And anyone wants to show dissent, please put a message uh, in the chat box or put your hand up. So moved, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I can't see any, so we'll take that as uh, supported. Thank you very much. Item two, urgent business. I've got no item urgent business to bring forward. Item three, division of agenda. I've got no, uh, I've, I'm not aware of any disclosure of exempt information during the committee. Um, item four, declarations of interest members. Again, put your hand up, shout out or write something in the box. Councillor Taylor, you, you're 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 muted. Hello. 
that's it. No, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm there now. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, um, I'm actually uh, the AOMB. Uh, this part of the AOMB. So uh, I, as a member of the AOMB, I need to declare an interest on that. Yeah, personal interest. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. The same for me too, please. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Rowe, as a personal interest member of the AOMB board. Um, any other members? No, can't see any. Thank you for the that item five public participation there are there is a list of members of the public who will be taking place um uh and, and they'll be called as and when their application comes forward um item six planning applications right members so we've just got the one application that's a, it's a tpo one zero one eight stroke t1 um over to Mr Marshall please. Thank you. I don't we can't hear you at the moment. Yeah, bear with me. Um, okay. hopefully you can walk, hopefully you can hear me now and yeah, absolutely. Now point. over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning everyone. Um I've brought this um Request for confirmation of TPO Tree Preservation Order 1018 to um, to committee having sought delegation from Councillor Long and Pierce, who um, because of um, a, lo a lot um, of local interest, I believe, wanted it to be brought to committee for a um, wider view, which I regard as quite sensible and helpful, to be honest. So um, I'll just go through a few slides I've got on it. Um, Okay, so um, in this plan, you'll see um, sort of drawn out area. The um, the black line gives a rough indication of the um, property where the tree grows across, and uh, I'll expand more on the reason for showing you that. And um, the blue circle, there they are, that, that's tree T1 of the TPO. Again, uh, aerial view. Um, for those of you who don't know the area that well, it just gives some context. Um, of the um, the presence of the tree, an indication of what other trees are in the area, um, in, in this sort of um, urban area, as it were, on the edge of Mal Marlborough, not Marlborough, Marlborough, noted. Um, hopefully that'll give some site context. So a little bit of background, and, and I won't go into the ins and outs, there's obviously been communications going on. Um, it's a council-owned tree, so unusually we serve the TPO on ourselves as the, on the, um, asset own tree as it were because I've, I believe there was a, a neighbour to it who um, had concerns there'd been branch drops debris fall uh, one branch came down and, and was noted to have cracked a tile um, with shade issues so um, a letter brought to my attention by Alex Wish the landscape officer indicated that the person living under the tree may seek the common law right to prune the tree heavily back to their boundary. Now, if that extent was going to be undertaken, I don't know, but it, uh, given my role as a tree preservation order officer, if you like, protecting the trees, uh, I did have concerns of how this would affect, affect the look of the tree and its, its benefit to the wider public. So um, after discussion with um, Alex Wish, we decided to serve a provisional tree preservation order. Um, and that order was, is not the one in front of us that order happened during covid during the first lockdown so we found difficulty in um, arranging a requested site meeting to everyone um, so they could bring them forward their concerns or support or whatever so because the clock was ticking on that we now we reserved and that the second one this order tpo 1018 is the one in front of us where i'm requesting uh, authority to confirm so the main concerns of the person, of, of the, the complainant, as it were, who lives under the tree at number four, Marlborough, is that the authority hadn't discharged its duty, they weren't inspecting the tree, and that recommendations of inspections weren't being enacted. So uh, clearly a, a issue to them and uh, one that we took seriously. Um, and the fact that these that matter was affecting their enjoyment of the property. I have spoke to the assets team and they have made it clear to me that there has been inspections um, made upon the tree 
and that the authority believes it's uh, it has discharged its duty. The the neighbour, the complainant, as it were, or the objector at this point now, uh, did commission their own tree safety report, which broadly mirrored that of our own tree safety report that dead wood should be removed, some branches should be removed, and uh, any cones, large cones that accumulate. It's a habit of this tree species that cones grow in masses on the tree and then shed off eventually in big lumps, which may have happened and caused a tile issue, a damage to a tile. Uh, we are we are aware of this, and I believe I've spoke I have spoke to the grounds maintenance chap, Mark Capper, and he's assured me that they have undertaken the removal of cones. There may be more developing as the tree carries on to grow. Dead wood has been removed and branches shortened. So. I think the main, the main issues that I would be grateful for the members view on is, well, I hope I've confirmed that the authority has discharged its duty of care. That there is going to be an ongoing issue from that, but we do have many assets that we do need to keep an eye on and inspect and uh, deal with our neighbours in, 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 a, in a structured manner, as it were. But does it affect their reasonable enjoyment of the property? Is the fact that they have a large tree over their property um, a large mature tree, I'd say of 80 to 100 years old. The fact that it's there as a tree, is it shades path, is it general debris fall that trees do have, it's, it's a consequence of living in nature. Um, and it can cause these conversations, I'll use that phrase for this coming forward many times. It's not the first time I've experienced this. Um, so you know, coming to committee is a useful exercise for me. We feel we've satisfied the duty of care and as much as we reasonably can. And that's the phrase reasonably is an authority. We, we, we make no promises and I don't think anybody in a professional industry would have promised that we would keep someone safe entirely all the time. And that would, that, that would be a false thing to do. But we, we, we feel given the public person, the amount of resource we've put into it, we feel we have reasonably discharged it. So the balance there is again, is that reasonable against having to carry on pruning it um, or inspecting it. I believe the amenity of value of the trees, as you will see as we go through a few more slides, does raise it as quite a prominent tree in the area. Um, I think I've uh, covered most of the points is this. This is the tree. You, you, you can um, you see the fact it stands alone. So that's it's quite a prominent individual. You can see the hillside behind. There's a, there's a public footpath that can see the tree and obviously the main the main Sulcombe Road roads in the estate. Um, so it, it, it's it's prominent. It's quite prominent. I think anyone would struggle to disagree with that. But if I move my cursor, in fact maybe this is a better place to go now. This if you take a straight line from there, if we didn't confirm the TPO, um, they could then they would then have the common law right if the TPO wasn't in place to prune this tree to this and I'm not saying they would go that far that's this is I'm, I'm trying to balance in my mind but uh, I, it's hard and I have to represent the public and sort of hold the conversation at this point so that could happen I'm not saying it would if the TPO wasn't confirmed so it was really I thought it could be confirmed but obviously council along councillor Pierce wanted brought forward so maybe you know that's possibly a sensible course of action given we didn't receive objections um conclusions. So several objections, six, possibly seven were brought to the original TPO. Um, only one was repeated in this second one, but because of the COVID situation and the difficulty from ourselves as officers to host this meeting that was requested on site and the difficulties of residents, obviously with lockdown regulations, uh, we've brought these forward for debate and um, so that everyone has had a it's an open forum, really. We didn't want to say no. Through, we, we could have said through process. No, it's only had one team objection, but that wouldn't have been fair, in my opinion, and Alex's as well. There's been two inspections on the tree. It was found to be safe in both. I've looked at it and found it to be safe. And Mark Capper, our ground, grounds maintenance, has found it to be safe. All recognise the need for dead wooding and removal of cones, um, but also all recognising it is a big tree over someone's house now. Um, as you will see, you would have seen. If moving forward, you did agree to allow the TPO to be confirmed, that we, that 
the normal application process is there where if the, if the resident underneath felt, felt um, they wanted branches removing, we, we would accept an application and, and regard it on its merits as per normal. And uh, if professionally supported, maybe some works could happen. If it was identified there was an immediate risk, uh, just as the case now, it would be wrong to the authority and we would deal with it. And the presence of the TPO does not affect our ability or our responsibilities to keep the resident as safe as we reasonably can. And that's obviously a position we are required to have and wish to have. Um, so I, I really would ask the members really just their view on how important the tree is as an amenity against the concerns of the resident, how it affects their uh, enjoyment of the property. Um, so my recommendation is we confirm the TPO, but um, I would now seek the members view on whether they would agree with that or not, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marshall. Um, members, any questions to Mr. Marshall? Uh, Councillor Taylor. Yes. Um, thank you, Chairman. It is, has anybody done an assessment on the route travel on this tree? Because it looks terribly close to the bungalow to me, and I don't think I would. Uh, I wouldn't feel safe sleeping underneath that when there's a force ten. Um, but what, have you uh, actually looked at the route travel on these trees? Because they don't go down, they go across on these conifers, don't they? Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, trees generally travel sideways. There's nothing deeper in the soil for them anyway. They don't go down, especially if the bedrock's there. Um, we haven't lifted the pavements. We, we know the roots are grown there because it's, it's lifted in places, the footpath. It is inspected by our rights... Um, localities officers so that they're, they're confident it's within a safe lift we could only and i'm gonna to have to use the word assume here because it's it's one of the things that when the property was built and i'm assuming the property was built mindful of the presence of the tree that the foundations would be in place we have an evidence to the contrary um it would be an expensive exercise to go down and do a trial trench and see that I don't believe any evidence or concerns has been brought from an engineer that the roots are damaging the property. Um, of course, if that came in, we, we would um, review that immediately. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, would the officer be able to provide the dates at which the tree inspections and indeed the cone removal took place, please? Yes, I can. Um, the tree inspection commissioned for the complainant, now the objector, uh, was in June 2020. So that gave itself a one year indemnity period. So it's still within that. Uh, to ensure we discharge our duty of care, we had a further inspection over and above mine and Mark Copper, Co Cappers by an external consultant in September 2020, which again indemnifies itself for a year. Um, both of them inspections recommended cone and dead wood removal. So, was there a second part to that question? I... No, no, that, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Long, please. Don't seem to be getting. Is is Councillor Long still with us? Do we know? I believe he is, but I think he's. I am mute. sorry, sorry, Chairman. I seem to have dropped out a little bit. Then, um, okay. the, my question is: um, You haven't, uh, Mr. Marshall, hasn't referred to the recent development to the west of the site, um, which involved um, putting in a retaining wall and removing um, soil. The retaining wall, I believe, went in within seven metres of the tree and there was land grading. 
and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the root protection area under British standards for that size of tree would have been between nine and 10 metres and the excavation of the retaining wall is in at seven metres. Has this been taken into consideration uh, with the impact on the tree? Because obviously the main wind direction is southwesterly towards south, southwest, westerly into the tree heading towards number four. And obviously, um, previously, that was an uncultivated, it was a cultivated arable area bank and is now a housing estate below that. Was that taken into consideration in reviewing it? Thank you for your question, Councillor. Yes, it was. Um, I looked through the planning application for the development. There was a tree protection plan in place. Um, as a quick calculation, I, I remember one of the reports saying the stem of this tree was 550 milli. Um, we times that by 12. So we are around the seven metre. So the excavation would have been on the very periphery of that protection area. Um, I would take confidence from the fact there was the tree protection plan, but also moving forward, I had made study and others had made study of the condition of the tree's crown. If the tree was beginning to suffer adversely as a consequence of root damage, we would have experienced it. And certainly at that diameter, that would be smaller feeder roots and not the main structural supporting ones, is, is my opinion. Okay. Just just confirmation once when that tree you said at one point that the roots don't tend to go down but go out, would they be heading sort of along the path rather than into the house and down to the west in your conclusion with the works that have been done in the area? They will grow where there's good soil. They're clearly growing under the, the shared footway that serves a couple of properties. They would have been proliferating in that grass bank, and there's no doubt of that. Um, possibly Councillor, I, I don't. That, that I'm, I'm entering realms there where I. No, it, it was. It was just my my point as to whether you'd done some surveys, whether you had evidence one way or the other. But obviously, um, that's. I, I, difficult to do unless you were there at the time of the excavation and the works being undertaken. Oh, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I looked at the plan impact for it. I saw there was a tree protection plan that they were on the periphery of that. Um, I wish I'd been able to comment on the housing estate, but that's possibly a different question. That's a different um, question, yeah. Yeah. OK, that's thank you. Part. OK. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. It's maybe just something I don't perhaps understand very well, but we were given a reference in the officer's report to go to TPO slash 1018 slash T1. And I've gone there like I always do for the reports and it, it says no, nothing is no, and it doesn't take you anywhere. It would be helpful. I just don't know if there's maybe I've, the number's been logged wrong or something, but I just wonder why, um, why we can't find any access to any other reports about this Monterey Pine. Thank you, Councillor. The amenity appraisal report was done, was made for TPO 100013, which I could call up now. Um, mm -hmm. And simply because the TPO was just a quick repeat of that, I didn't duplicate that. Um, so maybe that was a typo and it should have said, see, amenity appraisal report 1013. Uh, okay. All that does is measure the size and just make sure we fit within our agreed uh, appraisal scoring system uh, to make sure we um, follow in process. I Thank you. I yeah, no, it, was, it wasn't a criticism. It's just really, I think it's really important that, you know, if we, we cite numbers and things that people can access information, and certainly with trees. I mean, they're also very different. It'd be, yeah. been useful to see what, what has been looked at with the tree. Thank you. I'll, I'll comment later in the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holway. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, so what's the normal frequency of tree inspections, please, on an ongoing basis? Thank you, thank you, Councillor. I will I'll, I'll limit my, my knowledge on this. Um, I, I'm not involved in the assets. I, 
each one is generally based on the tree itself. We try to obviously inspect them as little as possible to either get them to a safe place or build safely around them. So, or you know, just to make sure that we don't have to do it because it becomes onerous. On this yeah. one, I would have to actually take advice on that. But the, the one thing I do know is it is on, on the radar is a clumsy word. But it's built into our tree management software. And I made that call this morning to check. And they are aware of the, uh, the importance and the, you know, the fact that there's a large tree very close to someone's property or within falling distance. And it, it will be inspected as per the recommendation. And that might be annually, but I don't say off the top of my head, Councillor, I'm afraid. But we will discharge okay. our duty of care. Thank you. I mean, it, it, it's a lovely looking tree. We had one the same, I think. Um, and I am aware that they do drop branches from time to time. The branches seem to die and then drop if they're not trimmed. So it's quite important that it's maintained regularly. And of course, if the cones are that big, that they're taken off. Um, do we indemnify the neighbours if indeed the tree was to blow down and damage their property? Yes, yeah. Um, so there are, <clears throat> excuse me, our normal responsibility.
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Felton. Right. Um, members, I'm now going to move to the speakers. Um, and the first speaker we have is uh, Miss Hurrell. Are you with us still? And, and just to say, we're back live now on the YouTube. It's all coming together well. Um, Miss Hurrell, are you are you there with us? Can't hear you. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You that's, lovely. that's great. Okay. okay. All right. All right, Miss Hurrell, just, just to say that you've, you've got three minutes. Um, just before those three minutes are up, you may hear a little prompt to say that you're, you've just got a few seconds left. Um, we've got a... Um, uh, uh, something's come up on there. I don't know if that's a, if if that's your representation um, up there. Um, but anyway, over to you and three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. The issues that we have with this tree primarily concern location. The official documentation cites this tree as being on public open space, but, but the stark reality is that it actually sits on a strip of waste ground two housing estates and a parking bay adjacent to a path which serves just four houses including our own. Our house is directly beneath the canopy of this tree. We have repeatedly requested an on-site meeting compliant with Covid guidelines to demonstrate the issues with this location but have repeatedly been denied. Our independent report and also the report commissioned by South Hams Council have both confirmed that the root system has already raised and damaged the adjacent path and that this damage will get worse. The reports also confirm that this species naturally produces large and plentiful cones which can and do drop at any time, but especially in poor weather conditions. You see the supplied photographs which show the examples of the debris, which has not only damaged our property but also been the cause misses to our family. Our property is directly beneath the canopy of this tree. We would be more than happy to maintain proposed amenity value with the replacement of this tree by new planting appropriate to the land and surroundings, planting which will not cause damage to the path and our property and will not present a danger to residents. Southam's council remains legally liable our solicitor is now preparing to present an invoice for roof repairs to the council. However, following the two storms since Christmas, there's been further damage which will also be invoiced in due course. We can't pick up our house and move it elsewhere. We can't access our property in any other direction. And it just seems nonsensical to continue in this manner when there is a viable solution. Opposition to this tree is widespread. We ask you to take into account all of these views, do not confirm the TPO, but remove the tree and replace it with more. 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you, I'm finished. Lovely, thank you very much. Ms. Arrell, that was excellent and well within time. Uh, members, any questions to Ms. Harrell? Um, I think I've got one come up in the... Um, Councillor Kemp. Kemp. Hi, Julian. Um, mine wasn't actually for um, the guest speaker. I was actually asking about if, um, uh, if there has been a settled claim for damages apparently already and um, so I was wondering if that, who that claim goes to. It's it's on page seven or fifteen of the um um dot uh, mod gov. Right. So does anyone know the answer to that? Um.
doesn't it's, sound it. So it, it says routes to damage the footpath serving properties leading to a settled claim for damages for personal injury. So I wondered yeah. who that went to. Who who pays for that? If I, if I may share. Yeah. Please. I, I, as I would imagine through any claim, it would go through our claims team assessed by the uh, insurers. And uh, if deemed we hadn't acted diligently, as a, for lack of a better word, settled them. Um, uh, yeah, that we have a policy and a process in place and uh, would have just gone through our claims team. Okay, so doesn't that indicate that the, the, the property is insurable? Yeah, no, I think you're getting that's this is for somebody who's tripped up on the path. All right, OK. And that's what that claim is about. That's nothing to do. And they would have made a claim and that would have gone through our claims department at South Hams. So that's nothing to do with the house. Um, Councillor okay, Holway. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I. Um, I was just trying to to weigh up exactly how close it is um is the house within toppling distance of the tree or is it just the garage would you wish me to answer that chair anyone please <laughs> yeah yes please mr marshall okay i i, I think um yeah, the, undisputably, the, the picture indicates even before the extensions extended the property under the tree that the, 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 the relationship is such that if the tree or even one of its major primary branches stems failed from above, the, it would if it blew that way. And then remember, there's other arcs it could have fall or could still fall. If it went that way, it would impact the, the property. Yeah. Thank you. Members, is there anyone else to who wishes to ask a question uh, of Miss Harold? Yes, if I might ask a question, um, just how how long have you lived in the house? Since 1985. Oh, thank you. C Councillor Foss, you wanted to ask a question. I, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, actual fact, you beat me to it. Exactly the same question. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Right. And any other members wishing to ask a question? Chairman. Councillor Hodgson, Chair. Councillor Hodgson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to put our hands, in, our hands up or put it in the chat box. So I've had it in both. Well, anyway. yeah. I mean, it's 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 meant, no, I just wanted to know that's all. Whatever. Yeah, anyway. for sure. It's, it's, meant to be in the, it's meant to be in the chat box, but I am taking it, picking up hands as well. Sorry oh, about okay. that. I, I would have cleared that up. But yeah. Um, because right. I did put it actually at 10.52, no problem. Anyway, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, Miss Hurrell um, okay. how different the tree was when she moved in. Now, obviously, we've just heard that she's been there 30 years or something. It was 1985 that she moved in. How different was the tree? Because if it's assessed to be about 80 or 90 years old, um, and it's obviously the way it's all been trimmed, I just wonder how different it was then when she moved into her house. Because obviously the tree was there before the house. Thank you. Right. Well, my husband's since 1985, um, and it certainly wasn't the height that it is now. Um, we first encountered problems in 2011 um, with the height of the tree. It's a species of tree that grows quite rapidly, um, but it certainly wasn't at this height at that time. OK, thank you. OK, and then uh, a question from Councillor Kemp. If you... uh, just wondered when the property was extended and if that if that it was extended under the tree recently. The property was extended um, about 14 years ago. And the first we had with this tree were about 10 years ago 10 or 11 years ago okay thank you councillor long thank you. thank you chairman um there's been some discussion about um insurance um 
Mrs. Harrell, have you had um, any issues with insurance? Because obviously you say that your first concerns were raised in 2011. Have you had in problems with either insurance claims or getting insurance? Because that's obviously been raised. Yeah, no, no we have any problems. And actually the solicitor that, that we're actually in contact with at the moment is through the, you know, the legal cover we have. Thank you. Right. Any more questions, members? No, in which case, thank you very much, Mrs. Harrell. Uh, and we yeah, will just yeah. come in very briefly, please, and ask anybody who's not speaking to turn their videos off, please, because we um, we seem to be having sound issues. OK, I hope you all heard that. Um, so videos off if you're not speaking, that would include me. Um, Right, in which case we will now move, no, we're going to move to uh, Councillor Yeoman, please. Good morning, Mr Chairman, Councillors. Can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, 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 we can. Yes, we can, yeah. Councillor Yeoman. Good morning, all. Um, <clears throat> Marlborough Parish Council is of the firm opinion that this is a large, old, non-native tree in the wrong place, and concerns have been raised about this tree for at least 12 years. We do not believe that the residents of number four Marlborough Park should have to live in fear beneath the tree. The tree was planted after the RAF married quarters were built and is now getting towards the end of its life. Experience of this species at other sites in the parish has shown that they reach an age and then tend to fail. The tree has been wind sculpted and the growth is away from the wind over the roof of number four, Marlborough Park. And number four is badly affected. Large pieces from the tree have fallen on the property, causing damage to the roof. And a member of the family was narrowly missed by falling debris. This has taken away their enjoyment of the amenity of their garden. Also, the access path used by residents of number four, number one, two, four, Marlborough Park is also beneath the tree. Excavations very close to the root protection zone in the view development below the windward side have added to the residents' concerns. They are worried that on windy days, and nights, branches, or indeed the tree could be blown down onto the house. And it must be remembered that Marlborough is a very windy village. The TPO was originally served on the 7th of February, 2020, and there has been adequate time for site meetings regarding this TPO between lockdowns. Other parts of South Ham's District Council, such as enforcement, have been operating outside in line with regulations this year. And as a solution, it is the settled view of Marlborough Parish Council and the residents of Marlborough Park that the TPO is not confirmed and the tree be removed. It should be replaced by smaller native species planted in the hedge line. This will enhance wildlife. 30 seconds remaining improve the hedge between the two estates and more importantly improve the life and worries of the residents thank you thank you councillor yeoman um any questions to councillor yeoman uh is, is councillor long is is that you or is that before I think that was, was before chairman that was before okay uh, councillor hodgson Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask, um, Ms. Ms. Harrell referred to a piece of waste ground. I, I never think of open space as waste ground. But the picture that we have on the screen in front of us, is this the line that the proposed hedgerow would be that um, Mr. Councillor Yeomans just referred to? And if so, how long would it be and how high would it be allowed to grow? Thank you. Well, depending on the species planted, but I mean, that is the line of the hedge behind that waste bin down through. 
I mean, you also see that how close where they dug away below is to the tree. The the wall is seven meters away, but they they dug and filled in between as well. So I mean, that is the line that we were talking about. Is that what you? you. I mean, the height of the thing depends on what's planted. And obviously, I'm not an expert in trees because we have none. Um, Mr. Marshall, you wish to comment? Mr. Marshall, are you on mute? Apologies. Sorry, I just draw attention to the fact that the question is not whether the tree be felled or not. It's do we confirm the TPO or not? Um, it would be a conversation with the assets department moving forward if it was felt the tree was to be confirmed, uh, felled. I, I believe they would want to have an interest in planting a hedge with the ongoing maintenance that would arise, where at the moment they have the stable situation of a, a tree of wider public benefit noting the concerns of the, of the resident and the, and the parish. OK, thank you, Mr Marshall. Um, do we have anyone else wish to ask a question or speak? Councillor Kemp. Hi, um, can we coppice, coppice the tree and, and plant a nice new hedgerow? <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, what we've got before us is whether the TPO is, is confirmed. If the TPO is confirmed, then any works on that tree must be agreed by Southampton District Council and the person that wants to uh -huh. change it. What, okay, what, but would that what, not be a, a, a reasonable solution, no? Well, the thing is, is, is in common law, you can chop anything that's over your property. So a lot of the tree and the picture is shown in the map that would be, they would be, the applicant would be, or, or I say the applicant, the objector would be able to chop that off without just, they don't have to speak to anyone about it at all. If a TPO right, served, okay. they can't do that, but they, that, but works can be continued, but there can be some works, but they just got to be in a, agreement with South Hams District Council. Um, okay. the, the, the hedge is a totally separate issue and we're not discussing that. Okay, thank you, Chair. And any other, yeah, Mr. Yeoman, you, you just wanted to say something? No, no, I was just waving, actually. Okay. I, I didn't know whether you finished with me or not. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, I think we have. Thank you very much. Um, right, over to the local ward members, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, just took me a second to find my microphone and camera and put it on. Um, I would like to preface my remarks by saying that normally I'm absolutely in line with um, what the tree officers want and I don't think I have ever questioned the confirmation of a tree order before. But this one really does raise issues of it being just the wrong tree in the wrong place. Um, I'd like to thank Mrs Burrell and um, the chairman of Marlborough Parish Council for coming along and putting the village's side of the story and indeed the resident's side of the story so well. Um, I think we, we've been given quite a lot of conflicting information here. We've been told by the tree officer that this tree predated the houses. Now, it's fairly obvious from what the chairman of the parish council has said that actually the houses were there before the tree. And from what Mrs Horrell said, that the tree has grown substantially since they have lived in the house or the family has lived in the house since 1985 or the middle of the 80s. I can't remember the exact date she said. Um, and it just seems to me that these people are living in this house absolutely terrorised by what this tree does to them. It shades their garden. It throws down cones that are the size of avocados. They are substantial, weighty objects that fall in the garden. They've had failure of branches that have fallen in the garden too. Um, and I just 
don't think it's fair to make people live under those circumstances. Now, it would seem that it got to the stage where they're having to claim money from the council. Um, that can't be a justifiable situation either. People should not have to live like that. <laughs> and the council should not be paying out for that kind of damage. Now, I've got trees that overhang my garden to a certain extent, but they're not trees that are immediately liable to failure. And they're not trees that do as much damage to my amenity as this tree does. I have a lot of sympathy with the residents in this case. Um, and I would really, in this case, ask the committee not to confirm this tree preservation order. I'm sure that both the um, parish council and the local residents will be entirely reasonable about a replacement tree on this small triangle of council land, if such a tree is wanted, or even better to plant one in the hedge. And that brings me to my final point, that until very recently, and some members of the Development Management Committee will remember visiting this site when we were considering the Baker development below it of about 60 odd houses, um, which are being, well, which is nearly finished now. Um, and this was an edge of village site immediately onto the AONB. It is no longer, and that really makes the position of this tree even less tenable than it was before. I don't think I've got anything else to say, Chairman, but um, please, members, think very carefully before you confirm this tree order. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearce. Uh, members, any questions for Councillor Pearce? No, in which case we'll move to the other ward member, Councillor Long. Thank you, Councillor Pearce. Chairman, thank you. Um, I have some, on, on the basis that um, members could not um, obviously do a site visit, and I think this is important. I think um, I'll thank um, Councillor Pearce for what she said. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of what uh, Councillor Pierce has said is the concerns that have been raised in a lot of areas. As members, we have to consider clearly, is the placing of a TPO an appropriate response to the concerns and issues raised today? And I think just to highlight some of the points that um, Councillor Pierce said, I have some slides and I did provide a, a video so you could see the uh, concerns and issues with the tree should be aware that it is a very high and exposed um, area and the site is approximately 100 feet above sea level is open to the southwest and southwesterly winds prevailing winds it's only two kilometers from the coast and some of the high points along the coast are only 122 to 132 feet um, the issues and concerns that I have and have been highlighted is that this has been something that has come forward uh, from Mrs. Harrell since about 2011, as she highlights. And the concerns, my concern is that the inaction in the past on this tree has caused these concerns and raised these concerns. There are concerns with the works to the west uh, with the new estate, the changes and impact that has on the route um, impaction. And I have some slides if um, they could be, if we could start running through them, please, so that members can actually see the sort of context and setting. Here you can see um, the new estate um, and you can start to see the where the excavation has taken place to the west. You can start to see some of the um, overhang of the property. If you can carry on moving through the slides, please, and I'll just talk to them. Here you can see its position um, through and looking at the new um, council, the housing estate um, car park, which now sits again underneath, almost underneath the tree as well. And you can see the level and depth of the excavation that has taken place. Can you carry on, please? Thank you. We can just run through the slides. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, thank you. Again, you can just so see the proximity. You can see the overhang there of the, I think we're going backwards, overhang. Here you can see the lean that it has. Here you can see the proximity. And this one particularly shows the overhang 
that the um, the pine has. There have been some points about questions on the age of the tree. Um, it's been said that it's 80 to 100 years old. Um, lifespan, 80 to 90 years. Some have been 150 years old. I think what I'd like to do is listen to the other members of the committee, their views, but I wanted members to see, as they haven't had the opportunity um, for an inspection themselves, that we carefully balance the placing of a TPO on this tree with the health and welfare of the local residents and the property. And also, as has been stressed by Councillor Pierce, we have to remember the issues that arise with the mental health impact and stress that this is apparently giving the family. Um, and this has been over some considerable time and is not diminishing as the age of the tree advances and there has circumstances to change. So, Mr Chairman, it's just an opportunity to show more shots of the tree and the position of the tree. Um, and I, I'll wait and listen to other members' comments. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Long. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, uh, so we'll move into the debate now. Uh, and I see Councillor Foss wishes to speak. Um, Councillor Foss. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, it seems to me we've lost a lot of common sense here somewhere. It's now obvious with all the changes that have gone on in the area that uh, this tree is no longer tenable, in my view. It, it's a non-native species, outgrown itself, uh, and there's developments uh, that have been approved properly around it. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the tree, as far as I'm concerned, had a very good life, uh, but it, it's coming towards the end of it. It's causing problems. There's been some very good suggestions made, which we can't do anything about today. But as far as I'm concerned, I will not be confirming the TPO on this tree. Thank you, Councillor Foss. Uh, Councillor O'Callaghan. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps more of a question, but um, it's been mentioned that if the tree is to go, or there's no TPO, and that um, the tree could be replaced. I'm not sure if um, this is in the remit of what we're doing today. I just want to clarify something. If we don't confirm the TPO, um, what sort of guarantee do we have, if any, that there will be a, it's been mentioned, more suitable tree should be there, native species? What guarantees are there that a condition of some kind can be placed so that one is there? Um, I'm not sure because I'm not normally on the planning committee, but um, I would like to know if that tree is not uh, is at risk by not having a TPO, that there is a guarantee, a cast iron guarantee that it will be replaced. I don't know if that is something that uh, is within the gift of the uh, committee. Thank you, Councillor O'Callaghan. Um, I, I, I mean, it's not what we're discussing today, but I, but I think, see, Mr. Wyman wish, wish to comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think I can answer the question. The, the bottom line is there are no, we can give no guarantees that the, the trees can be replaced today. All, all we're looking at today is whether we are confirming or not the protection of the tree through a tree preservation order. We're not, look, we're not, this isn't an application to fell the tree. It's it's whether it's then protected or not. And as as you rightly said earlier, um, Chair, if the, if the TPO is not confirmed, then under, uh, un, under, common law and I'm sure Mr Marshall correct me if I'm wrong here but under common law the the neighbouring property can remove any branches or limbs that are over overhanging over sailing their property the, the ultimately the tree is in um, council ownership and it will be down to us as the landowner to then decide whether we wish to remove the tree or uh, and if we do whether we want to replant it but that that's not a matter that's not a planning matter it's not a matter for um, this committee at the, this moment in time, we are simply looking at whether we protect the tree or not, but not what happens after that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Holway. Oh. Um. I'll take someone else first, Councillor Holway. Yeah. You're muted now. I'm I'm back in the phone. All right, okay, yeah, Sorry, Chairman. Um, yeah, uh, it's a lovely looking tree, and and it would be a shame 
to to reduce it or fell it. But well, God moves in dis, in mysterious ways. And if God decided that after a particularly wet spell, there was a wind from the northeast, there's a fair chance that that tree would blow over onto the new development. I mean, it, it's wonderfully um, sort of aerodynamic the way it's grown to cope with winds from the southwest. But quite often we find that if we have a wet spell and the wind is in the opposite direction, direction as it were that's what takes the trees out and, and I think if we're saying that if we do everything properly but the tree blows down it's an act of God and there's no indemnity from our insurance then I, I think really the reasonable thing to do is for this council to take the tree down now I know that's not what we're talking about now but I would like to move please that we kick this tree TPO out and we, we do not confirm it. Thank you. Thank thank you, Councillor Holway. Uh, Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I actually would like to support the officer recommendation and I'd like to move that on the basis that, I mean, and I'm sorry if I've just missed a couple of comments, somebody came to my door. Um, I think um, it's the, what the officers really cl made clear is that all we're, at, that we're being asked to do is to support them being involved in the future of this tree. Um, it has a high amenity value. I mean, you look at any of the pictures, it's an outstanding tree. It's very old. And I think what they're not saying, they're not saying that that means it'll, it'll remain forever. You know, I'm on the planning committee at um, Totnes Town Council and quite often we have to deal with trees in places that, you know, the tree has carried on growing around that within the housing areas and sometimes the difficult decision has to be taken but I think it would be really good to have our officers involved in the decision of what goes in there afterwards because that little piece of as I say I was quite slightly offended when it was referred to as waste ground because actually it's an important part of the habitat and I think what Councillor Yeoman described was potentially more in improvement in the habitat because that tree as fabulous as it is and as important it is to the habitat, I mean, maybe a different type, you know, by developing a new hedgerow there could be in conjunction with the um, land at the immediate householders adjacent would give everybody confidence that something really worthwhile could be brought in to be, replace it. But I think it'd be really good to see the council involved in it because it is our little piece of land. And I think it's something that we could then be part of the conversation. So I would support the officer's recommendation. They're not saying that means the tree will be there forever. It's just that they'll be involved in how this goes forward. And I think that would be a responsible way. And I think it's the fact that they've actually put this offer forward. I think we should um, respect our officer's um, involvement in this. Thank you, Councillor Hodgson. Uh, Councillor Long. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I interesting listening to um, what people have said and obviously as I said what we are considering as has been clearly said is a TPO and as I said before is it an appropriate response to the concerns and issues raised today um, on this specific case I do not believe it is um, there has to be more dialogue and an approach that does address amenity public benefit now and in the future potentially increases biodiversity and addresses, importantly, the health and safety of our residents and, men and their mental well-being as well. Um, I, this is a difficult one for me. Um, I think most people will know I'm a tree person. I have been all my life, always will be. I've been called a tree hugger before and have when younger and more able to climb trees have done so to save trees so this is not an easy one but there are always times when you have to balance many things and this is one such occasion um mr chairman this is one such occasion a really incredibly rare time when i have to say that i would be voting to refuse confirmation of this tpo I believe there are a lot of issues that have and concerns that have come forward. Primarily, I have to say, inaction in the past by the council on this tree that have increased and caused these concerns because we've heard that um, concerns were raised back in 2011 and 
the response has been more reactive than proactive. I have to say that I am pleased with the comments uh, and understand and you know would expect them from um, Lee Marshall on what could would be done um, going forward. But I believe that it doesn't address and clearly address those issues. Something far better um, could be done. I really do have concerns um, about the works that were done to the west with the new estate and the potential impact that has on that tree, you know, now and in the future and the potential decline of the tree. I think there are so many points um, arguing against this tree. And I think that if the TPO is not confirmed, there is more opportunity. And I would like to see that opportunity for better discussions and more discussions, potentially what can be done um, in that area where we can actually see, you know, amenity improved, increased biodiversity, and as I've said, remove or address the issues that neighbours have. And of course, we have new neighbours below that tree as well in the new um, housing estate. And they've obviously haven't had the worst of the um, storms. If storms come from the north or east, then they will be, you know, moving that tree in the usual sort of the opposite direction to the normal prevailing winds. It is, and I, I have to say, Monterey pine are and can be fantastic trees in the right place and when able to develop naturally. And they do well in this area and can make a really valued contribution to the tree cover in an area, you know, particularly as feature trees in prominent positions. But it comes down to being the right tree in the right place. And unfortunately, however magnificent, and I do believe they are magnificent Monterey pine, even though they're not native, they do very well here in Devon and particularly in this area when they can develop properly without interference. And I think the problem is that this is one of those cases where it is the wrong tree in the wrong place. And we need to get in its place the right trees for that place. So, Mr Chairman, it is one of those very, very strange times when I have to put the concerns of the local residents um, there and the, with the ability to actually potentially improve what is there. So, Mr Chairman, I really do believe that um, this is not a family seeking of you. This is not a family who do not like trees. Um, they wish to continue to enjoy their home without concerns of fear for their safety. Um, they do wish to talk about this. Mrs Hurrell has clearly said about this. I think TPO will hinder discussions and the possibility of working out what is best for the family, the area, the local treescape and biodiversity. I think we have an opportunity here and we shouldn't see the um, non-confirmation of a TPO as a negative. I think we need to open up the dialogue here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Long. Um, Councillor Rowe, I see that you're prepared to second Councillor Holway's uh, proposal to refuse the TPO. Um, oh God! Can you can you just say that? Because I don't. Because obviously members of the public can't see the, the the chat box. So can you just confirm that again, Councillor Rowe? Hello. Councillor Rowe, you're on mute. If not, Chairman, I'm happy to second. OK, Councillor Brown has seconded that. Uh, so Councillor Brown has seconded the proposal to refuse the TPO. Uh, Councillor Foss. Sorry, sorry, Chair, chasing the mouse again. Um, no, I, 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 no, I've not a question to ask. Thank you. No. OK, thank you. Councillor Kemp. Hi, um, I'd just like to support what Councillor Hodgson has said, actually, and Councillor Long. Um, surely the TPO gives us control. Um, without that, we can't insist on on replanting or anything of a you know biodiverse hedge. 
the tree um, could become more of a danger if people start lopping bits off it. Is that not a fair point? Yeah, thank you. That's that's absolutely um, right. Members, does anyone else wish to speak? We've had a proposal to refuse the confirmation of the TPO and that has been seconded. Uh, we've had uh, and, and I'll, I'm going to take that vote first. Uh, um, we then had a proposal to confirm the TPO, but we'll see what happens first with the uh, um, with the with the votes refusing the, the confirmation first. Um, Counts, uh, uh, Mr. Marshall, you wish to say something? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I just want to round up my comments, if I may, quickly. Um, the um, eloquently put by the local ward member and um, all of these thoughts he's um, he's made went through my mind. So uh, there were obviously uh, nothing was no decision to TPO. The tree was made in a hurry. But I am representing the wider public interest here of people who see the tree externally. Um, we have sought as an authority to discharge our duty of care to our neighbour there. Um, yes, it, it has happened recently um, it, and it is somewhat reactive, but that doesn't, in my mind, mean that that is a negative. It's, it's possibly a lesson learned there and uh, the dialogue box is very clearly open. Um, as, as it's native and non-native species is, is, is not relevant really. In fact, it, it, it's adapted and grown very well and it's one of our, maybe it's an Edwardian legacy tree or possibly maybe slightly after that area, but it's what we see in the area and it's what defines the character internally and externally for the AOMB. Um, so I just wanted to say, yeah, I, I'm just trying to bring attention to the wider public interest I'm seeking to preserve here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Marshall. Um, Councillor Hodgson, you, you wish to be quick? You've already Very had... Quick. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, are we able to put any conditions on the TPO such that um, this would not commit this tree to be remaining, remaining, but but potentially subject to replacement with other um, other um, trees that, or growth planting? That is all part of a TPO. The thing is, is that once a TPO is served, you can't do anything to that tree unless you have exactly those kind of negotiations. Fine. So OK. That's, the, that sort Thank of you. Thing. that's fine. Right. Thank you. Members. Um, We've 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 got a, uh, a proposal to refuse the confirmation of the TPO, which has been proposed and seconded. So we'll take that first, um, and I uh, will hand over to Mr. Um, apologies, we've lost Councillor Rowe. Um, IT are on the issue, trying to get it back in now. Okay. Can I second Councillor Hodgson's, please? Uh, that's Councillor Kemp. Yes, you you certainly can. Um, so we'll do that. We're going to have to wait for Councillor Rhodes to come back in. Councillor Foss. Councillor Foss, did you wish to say something? Yeah, um, I don't really like asking this question, but I need to ask this, Miss Long. Um, we heard Councillor Hodgson say earlier that she had to go to the door and hope she didn't miss any of the debate. Um, that's a technical question that somebody might pick up later. Thank you. Can I just say, I think I just missed what you were saying because you were speaking when I left. You were speaking when I came back, Councillor Foss. Okay. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm said. not trying to get rid of you or anything. I just make sure that um, be somebody, uh, you know, might pick that up. That was all I was concerned about. Okay. Well, I'm just being frank. Thank right. You. Thank you. All right. Um, I need to take advice on that, please. Sorry, Julian. I'm Chair, and I'm back now. I've got back in, so don't think I missed anything. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rowe, yes, while while you were away, Councillor Rowe, um, basically what happened is we had that, um, you wanted to second uh, Councillor Holway's proposal to um, to refuse the, the confirmation. Um, because you weren't there, uh, Councillor Brown stepped in and seconded it instead. Okay, that's um, fine, thank you. Uh, so when we lost 
Councillor Rowe, Rowe um, there were some comments from, um, I think there were some comments from Mr Marshall. If you could, Mr Marshall, if I summarise surmise those, they were to say that, that obviously from, from the tree, uh, South Ham District Council's point of view, um, is that they were representing the amenity value to the whole of the South Hams rather than just the local residents. So, um, and as such, he he, he felt that the, that the TPO should be confirmed. Um, right. Um, I, people have been a bit in and in and out. I, I th Miss Young, are, are we okay with all of this? Um, I've taken advice and um, I have been asked if, um, as Councillor Hodgson states that um, Councillor Foss was speaking while she went and came back, if Councillor Foss could just reiterate briefly what he was saying, then it should be fine. Okay, lovely. Uh, Councillor Foss, are you okay to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Well, bas basically, I, I, from what I can remember, I said that I thought that we need to have some common sense on on this. Um, I uh, and I would not be supporting the TPO uh, in this circumstance. Thank you. Lovely. Right. In which case, we will move to the vote. Um, so, uh, members, we've got a proposal which we've got a which has been posed and seconded to refuse the confirmation of the TPO. And I will hand over to Miss Young, who will now take the vote. Um, Miss Young, over to you. Thank you, Chair. If you can confirm, please, that you have been here for all of the um, debate and let me know if you are voting for or against rejection of the TPO. Councillor Abbott, please. I have been here for all of the debate. I've listened to it all. It's this double negative thing, which is the problem. I am agreeing with refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Brazil. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've heard the debate and I am against refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Brown. I have heard all of the debate and I'm voting in favour of refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Foss. Um, I've heard all of the de debate and I'm voting in f favour of the refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you. I've heard all of the debate and I'm voting against refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Holway. I've heard all of the debate and I'm voting for refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Kemp. I've heard all of the debate and I am against refusal of the TPO. Thank I you. Councillor Long. Thank you. I have heard all of the debate and vote in favour of refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor O'Callaghan. I've heard all the debate and I would like to vote against refusal of the Thank TPO. You. Councillor Pringle. I've heard all the debate and I am voting um, for um, refusal of the TPO. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. Um, I've heard all the debate apart from the little bit when I dropped out, which I've been filled in on, and I am voting against um, the approval of the TPO. I'm voting ag for the rejection. Yes, yes. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. I've heard all the debate and I'm voting for refusal. Yeah. Chair, that is... Eight uh, for refusal, therefore the um, TPO is not confirmed. Thank you very much, Ms Young. Yes, that, so the confirmation, uh, the TPO is not confirmed on that, so that tree does not have a TPO on it. Um, thank you, members. Uh, do, you, do you want to take a quick break or should we move straight on? Um, quick we break, please, Chairman. Sorry. Move on, Chairman. Move on. No, I'd like to take a five-minute break, please. Oh, for goodness sake! We don't... Right, I'm afraid, Councillor Rowe, being a lady, we have to. Um, we, we'll 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 do what she wants.
So we'll have a five minute break. So back here at quarter <laughs> to 12, please. Cool. Yeah, quarter to midday, quarter to 12. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. by members and if I remember rightly this is one of the, the meetings where it was um, it was a little bit damp um, yes <laughs> if, if, if it, I it right. definitely was to get it down the rain yes yeah that's if I remember rightly so the 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 council's view in refusing this application was that the the proposed dwelling failed to conserve and enhance the landscape character and scenic and visual quality of the area, which is within the South Devon A and B. And there's also concern about the loss of a green space between buildings. Now I've picked out the, what I think are the relevant parts of the inspector's the decision letter. Um, and he took the, the second element first in terms of the loss of the green space and considered that the site and gardens of the properties provide space around the buildings. However, there are numerous gardens in the surrounding area um, and such gaps are not particularly noticeable or a characteristic feature in this part of Kingswear, and the loss of that that gap was, in their opinion, was acceptable. <clears throat> the the key issue for for me, I think, I, I think members were whilst not belittling that concern. I think your bigger concern was around the the the, the impact on the air, the impact on the A and B, um, <clears throat> and the character appearance of the wider area. But the inspector looked at it, considered that the three story building would be lower than adjacent property. It would maintain the line of the second row of properties to which it bore lines. It therefore reflects and reinforces the prevailing pattern of development with a strong sense of horizontal built form um, that runs across the hillside. It wasn't out of proportion. It wasn't overbearing. It wasn't dominant. And he considered that it did preserve and enhance the the local characteristics and it was acceptable in the AUMB. Um, happily answer any questions if members have got anyone on that particular one. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, the the second application is for the, the expansion of Moorview Touring Park and to effectively change it from a touring park to um, a site of with lodges. Um, it also included um, a new reception and leisure facility on the site. The inspector concluded um, that there would be a significant impact on the landscape, and that impact on the landscape wasn't outweighed by the economic benefit that the expanded site or the extended site and the change to site would bring. Um, and that there were, on the basis that was potentially so, um, such significant harm. Um, you'll note from the the majors list that's later on that there is there is another current application in for that, uh, but the applicants are, are considering um, what they want to do following the appeal decision. The the th third one at the chase. Sorry, sorry, Patrick, that that one is not Arm Valley. It is Chargerlands. Say again. That uh, application for the leisure homes from yeah. McFarland. That yeah. is that's Charterlands, <laughs> not Arm Valley. Um, that's in my ward. I don't. I'm not sure where we're saying it. It is in that ward. Well, you got you got on the top of that. Uh, oh, oh, Valley Ward. Sorry, my apologies. Yes, I, I didn't. Okay, I'll check that. Yeah, that's definitely in my ward anyway. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll double check it. I think we need to make sure it's right for the for the application. Check. Yeah, okay. um, Erm Valley used to include Modbury until the boundary changes. <clears throat> I'm one. When did they? Would they have changed before 2017? Yeah. Right. I, I can't remember when they changed. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 a, 2000, it's, it's a 2017 application. They, so. Yeah, they changed in 2015. Okay. 
Okay, look, members, let me let me check on that one and apologise if we've got it wrong. Um, the third the third appeal was um, the chase Warren Road Thelston. Um, the we were concerned about the how the impact on neighbours and the the harm caused to the character and appearance of the area, which was both of which were shared by um, or mirrored the views of the, the parish council. Um, the inspector considered that the alternative that there wasn't harm caused by to the character and appearance area and it wasn't it didn't cause it any additional harm to the immunity of the neighbours. Um, I think the, the inspector's gone through it in, in some detail and has set out the reasoning, his reasoning for that. Um, I, I respect that, but I still disagree with his conclusions, if I'm being in totally honest. And finally, the Ashbr uh, Frogmore Orchard at Ashbrington, <clears throat> um, the inspector considered it would urbanise an undeveloped site, it would cause harm to the area and B, it's outside the logical boundary of the settlement, Therefore, it's contrary to our our spatial policies for the location of uh, of new dwellings. Again, and not not a um, an appeal decision that I, I would have absolutely expected on that particular site. And that's it. Happy to answer any additional questions on appeals, Chair. Thank you, Pat. Any <coughs> questions, members? Um, Chairman, just to say, I yeah. agree, Pat, with what you said about the. Uh, the one at the Chase, Warren Road. Yeah. As no. do I. <laughs> yeah, right. But unfortunately, it's, it's the inspector's view that counts. Um, <laughs> Quite. Right. Uh, no more questions. We'll move on to plan, planning performance indicators. Um, Pat, is that you again? It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid you got my dulcet tones with this one and the next one. Oh, lovely. Um, the... Before I, before I, I briefly touch on the, the the information in front of you, just a, a, a little bit of background information in terms of, of caseloads might be of, of um, interest. Um, the I've done a little bit of work looking at the level of app, the level of applications we get, and this this isn't just planning applications. This is all the applications that will come into um, development management to deal with. So it's it's planning apps, listed buildings, permissions in principle prior notifications, discharge conditions, tree works, except um, on TBO trees, etc. Um, in just on calendar years, in 2019, we had 2,518 applications to process. In 2020, that's gone up to 2,802. So it's an, from 19 to 20, it's an 11% increase on on cases that are that are coming to us, which are, it surprised me. I, I knew there was a little bit of an increase, of, but I didn't appreciate it was quite um, quite as high as that. That's, that's quite a significant number to go up um, for over the, the last sort of 12 months. The coming on to the the performance, the the top two top two tables are um, I show that we're, we're above the the target we need to be. That's that's fine. Um, that's with extensions of time. The second two tables are without extensions of time. Majors are about where I'd expect them to be because um, most will need a section 106 and that that can take some time. The the non-majors are still Pat. below. What I'd, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. May I interrupt and just ask, can you use your cursor? Yes, I can use my cursor. What, Would you what? like to do that? So, <laughs> Okay. What? What? Okay. The, the top two graphs. Can you see that? I don't know if you yes, can see it. Though. Thank you. So right. So the top two graphs here. Yes. Are that's major applications. Yes. And that's the percentage we do, we deal with on target. So that's either the thirteen weeks or an extended time as agreed by the applicant. Okay. And that's non. That's for non majors. Wow. Okay. The, the black line is um, national targets that we would be. Um, judged against if we fell below on a rolling two-year um, right. two-year time frame. Okay. So that's with the, <clears throat> the extension of time. The, the two blasts below, so this one is the, the majors. If you just look at how many have we done in 13 weeks without an extension, of, an agreed extension of time, that's that table. And this is for non-majors, how, how many we've done, 
percentage we've done in eight weeks <clears throat> without an extension of time. The, okay. The, this is still lower than I would like it to be, to be honest, but it, it is definitely heading in the heading in the right direction, albeit um, a very gradual increase. But we'll, we'll see how that how that um, continues. The these three are simply to do with um, application numbers in, but this is planning applications. So that's the number received. That's the number we have on hand. And this is the number determined. Um, so you, you'll know that the 2021, other than early on in lockdown one, we've had consistently more applications in than the, the previous year, which reflects the the workload, although we've clearly have done did do some work to reduce what we had on through lockdown one. And then the number of applications is um, broadly in line with the number that we, we get in. So we, we're not building a backlog. Um, I have a question, please. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> you're, you're providing these so that so that we understand the background to the planning situation that you're dealing with but when you talk of that bottom right hand bar graph um you expressed some concerns about it not being what you would really like but mm -hmm. what, what's the context and what are the consequences uh, and i'm sorry that you don't really like it but i don't know <laughs> I don't really know okay. what the implications are the 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 implications are that on uh, we what I start we're, we're judged on the number of applications we we deal with and certainly on non-majors the number of applications we deal with within an eight-week time period and the the number that we deal with without without going through an extension of time is less than I'd like it to be i.e we're not dealing with as many within the that set eight-week period as I would like us to be um, be dealing with, I'd like it to be a, a little bit closer to sort of okay. 65, 70 percent. So it does mean that we are not dealing with applications, some applications okay. as, as swiftly as we could be. That yeah. being said, um, there is there is a um, a debate that I will probably bring bring back to you at some point in a couple of meetings time around if you've got an application, if you've got a, someone's domestic extension application in front of you. And it's not quite OK, so but with some minor changes, it could be OK. Should we be accepting those minor changes, agree an extension of time and get them an approval, say, within eight weeks, because you'd have to re-advertise it? Or do we simply say, no, what, what you've come in with isn't good enough, we're going to refuse it and you're going to have to resubmit and do a, a further application? Mm -hmm. And there's 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 pros and cons to both of those, I think, from a from a applicant from a customer's perspective i think most applicants would would, would rather that we um we dealt with their application as swiftly as we can i.e we we accepted some revisions and we advertised it and got them an approval within eight weeks than a refusal in eight weeks and then a, an approval later on in a further eight weeks but that then reflect that then can be can reflect on us negatively because it's an application we're not dealing with within an eight-week period. Yes, thank you. So, are, are you hide bound by a government <coughs> guideline, and uh, and and that's why we can't just accept your sensible way forward? Well, we 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 not not really because if you look at the the table in the top right hand top right hand corner, we are clearly well over the government target because in most cases. Um, applicants will agree an extension of time for us to determine the application because it's in their interest to do so because mm. they're getting an approval so it's not in terms of the the reporting figures back to mhclg no absolutely we're not in um we don't have any issues with that it's more of i suppose my perception and i know from speaking to some members their perception that we should be dealing with a few a few more okay. within an eight week uh, with an eight-week period, and we need to look to see whether we're we're as efficient as we should be. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll move on to the next page. Unless there's any other questions on this page. 
no okay so this is um the fee income the top sorry the the, the top two are that's fee income from planning applications and whilst you'll know i've said we've got about an 11 percent increase in application numbers the the overall the fees are significantly down on what they were the previous financial year that is predominantly due to the level the overall level of playing fee income you get or we get is skewed one way or the other by a very small number of very large applications so when the joint local plan was adopted that put a lid on quite a lot of speculative residential applications that we used to get when we didn't have a five-year housing land supply before the joint local plan was adopted and it doesn't take many more than three or four large um, residential applications that makes a 150 200 thousand pound difference because you're talking about 30 40 30 40 50 grand um, planning fees for those so it, it, it is the fundamentally it's down to having not that many large applications in as there's really not um, the fee level compared compared to the year before um, and the other graph here is um, income from pre-apps it was low in Q1 because we stopped doing pre-apps for a while until we could work out how we could do them in the um, in lockdown since we've we've been doing that they've come in with and the income is now higher than it was last year so we, we are getting a, a greater number of pre-apps coming in and that's that's demonstrated on the the graphs below happy for me to move to the next slide yes I'm excellent and then <clears throat> this is um, again this is enforcement so that's cases received cases closed and outstanding what I'm pleased about is that there was clearly a an increase in enforcement cases received in Q2 and Q3 um, but that's also mirrored by an increase in the ones being closed and the work well, although the there was more cases coming in the workload is still on a downward the the caseload on hand is still on a downward uh, or plateaued trajectory so we're getting more in but we're not actually building a, a greater back uh, as a greater backlog happy to answer any questions on on this one chair yeah, yes, please. This is Victor again. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the dates about the enforcement cases go back quite some time, and, and maybe they're just more difficult uh, to, to 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 pursue. I, I don't really want to get into the details mm -hmm. of any individual ones. Just just this time period. Uh, maybe you have a comment or not. <laughs> there there will be. There'll be a number of reasons why there are some old um, enforcement cases. Some are that we simply haven't come to to deal, that we haven't finally um, dealt with them in their entirety. Some are that we've um, we've served an enforcement notice, but that enforcement notice has gone to um, an appeal, so that will that will take nice. time. And then if um, and I can think I can specifically think of one in um, Ivy Bridge where we've taken we've served an enforcement notice they've appealed they've lost the appeal but the enforcement notice ceasing the residential occupation of the building doesn't um, doesn't bite for another four or five months um, so we'd have we need to keep that case open until that compliance period has uh, has finished, so we can then go and check it and see if they've complied. And if they're not complied, then we'll have to start looking at potentially legal proceedings to do so. So there are some cases where enforcement action takes a very long time, even yes. if we hit everything as quickly mm -hmm. as we can. As soon as you get in an appeal process, that can put an awful lot of time on it. Um, Is this meeting live at the moment? Yes. It's still public. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's why I'm, I'm not. I'm, I won't mention any specific. Nope. I have none. Uh, individuals or, or addresses on on in my response, um, but I do acknowledge there are a number of um, enforcement cases that 
that have some age that we need to revisit and see how we um, what what steps we need to do to, to progress those. It's the piece of work I've absolutely got to do. Um, Denise. Thank you. Um, yeah, questions, a couple of questions to Pat. Um, yeah, you've mentioned about um, closing some cases, but still having, there's still an awful lot outstanding. It's similar numbers, um, just on 400, um, so that the basically the caseload doesn't reduce. It's something which comes up a lot at Kingsbridge Town Council. Certainly um, local people perceive that it's frustrating that enforcement isn't happening as quickly as they'd like. And um, I believe you've had, you've recruited more enforcement officers, but I mean, in your opinion, do you need more enforcement officers? That's what it looks like from the outside. And if so, are you likely to ask for them? And I've got another question after this one as well. At the, at the, my honest opinion, at the moment, I don't think we do need more enforcement officers. I think there's the, actually the, the fact that the case has, has remained stable I think is a positive thing because whilst the caseload is running stable, that's in a in a situation where we've been getting more cases in than we had before. So we are closing more than we did before just to to keep that that caseload stable. I think there there's there have been also a number of issues. It is more difficult to to progress enforcement when, when you're in lockdown because whilst you can have um, you can visit sites from the public realm and you can go out on site unaccompanied. It is very difficult to arrange to go either into someone's property or onto the land, especially if they turn around and say, look, we're, we're shielding here, you can't come. And we've got to respect that. So I think that the last the last 12 months has been a, has been a challenge for other reasons. And there was some, uh, there were have been occasions where some of the enforcement officers have been um, dealing with more pressing COVID-19 actions that the council had to had to undertake, rightly so. Um, but I, th I think, I think at the moment it's it's too soon for me to be saying no. No, we need more. We need to we need to see um, see where we are after um, this this next lockdown, and then re revisit how we we're, we're dealing with enforcement, and then take a view. But at the moment, I I think we we have sufficient resource to deal with the numbers that are coming in. Okay, thank you. And the other question, I understood that. Understand that. The other question is, um, as it happens. Um, a resident asked, spoke to me yesterday and said um, he has an enforcement issue. It's now become a retrospective application, obviously not going to name anybody. Um, but what, what he says, he's contacted um, enforcement and, and yourself, Pat, and he says it was back in September about his issues. Uh, and he also says he didn't get a reply. What, what's the um, what's the policy on um <coughs> Uh, contact with the public who have issues about enforcement because he, he says um, it may have got lost of course he says he didn't get any reply and um, I was somewhat surprised so I just wanted to ask you while you're while you're here um, what the policy is on members of the public if they attempt to contact officers well they should get a response okay well, well maybe I, I'll I, ask I, I, to try I, again. I, I don't know that I, off the top of my head I don't know that specific um specific case if you if you'd like to email me the details then i'll look i'll absolutely, look, absolutely yes. look into it yes i will thank you um kate hi yeah it's uh, it's kind of similar to um what denise is asking i've oh sorry someone's at my door i've i've got several cases that i'm concerned about pat can we discuss after after this meeting please um, I'm supposed to be going straight into another meeting after this meeting, but I think I've got I've, I think I've got your email about them anyway, haven't I? Yeah, you should yeah. you should have done. Um, yeah. And and I wondered about whether we could start using a drone for for those I, sites that are difficult to get to or dangerous, as one of mine might be. I don't know what the licensing issues are around the use of drones for effectively surveillance okay because i i know a man who can <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I i i suspect there are all sorts of hurdles and hoops to go over and through before a public authority can use a drone for surveillance right okay <clears throat> can we look into that though as a authority 
could look into it. Um, yeah, I think it's probably a thing for, for legal. You need to look into that, really. OK. OK, well, can we initiate that? Because there yeah, seems I, to be... I, I, I don't know if James is. I don't know if James is still on the call, and whether he's got a um, an immediate view, James Felton. Hi there. Hi James. Hi. Sorry, it went a bit crackly, Chair. Can I assist at all? <clears throat> yeah. No. What it's it's what is it about is that um, Kate is wondering if we can use drones. As a way of checking out um, uh, enforcement cases, or, or I mean, just generally, as a way of gathering data for uh, uh, for the council. Yeah, on, only for for those sites that are are difficult for one reason or another to reach, or to gain access to, or to see from any other viewpoint. Um, surely, it would speed up the process when enforcement is required that they have all the evidence and information they need. Yes, I am aware that other authorities do this um, and I think what they do is um, they inform the landowner in advance just to avoid any complaints being made against them. Um, I could potentially look into this and come back to you separately um, rather than give some off the cuff advice mm. and potentially yeah. misinform people. Um, but it's certainly an, evol an evolving area in light of the COVID and the lockdowns that we've been experiencing. So I can look into it and perhaps come back separately if that helps. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, James. Thanks. Thank you, James. Chair, James, I can, if I'm allowed to butt in, um, well, we're looking at the we're looking at um, the regulation of surveillance and that kind of thing tomorrow at audit. So we could ask a question there. OK, I don't know, James, if you're around tomorrow for, for that audit committee meeting, that might be useful. Um, I was just think, I mean, you know, Google Earth do it. The, the only other hesitation I would have is. And this is the cynic and very much cynic in me, but if we have to give advance warning that we're going to be flying a drone over your property to see if you're doing anything you shouldn't be. Um, I, I, I don't know whether that would be as effective as an unannounced visit. Yeah. yeah, but you, you're hard pushed to get on a particular site that I'm thinking about. You won't get in there. You'll get eaten by their dogs. <laughs> well, yeah. there's there's there's, a, there's there's ways and um, there's ways and means. But uh, anyway, let, we, let, we can look let, into it. Yeah, let's look into <clears> our <throat> discussion here now. Um, right, uh, I think I've got Mark. Yeah, you've yeah. got a question. Yeah, Chairman, um, Pat, it's really a, a staffing question when looking at all the charts are you at full complement are you happy i know you you specifically addressed the issue around enforcement are you happy with the staffing levels for yeah. planning pre-apps chairman with you with your permission can i respond to that question after um because I, I can probably go into some some details that i wouldn't particularly want to go into on a, on a public meeting that's okay important. yeah that's fine yeah Simply because it's a staffing matter, and I, and I think that's that is a private matter. Fine. Okay, yeah, no, that that's perfectly okay. Um, Jackie, um, thank you. Yeah, I've got two questions. Um, in the um, the uh, un, unresolved one of six, there was a listing there of the parish council's application for Brimhay, which is obviously you know five years old at this stage. But interestingly, I just wanted to raise an issue that was raised with me with the resident just recently. The planning application that actually went through for Brimhay, which was with South Devon Rural Housing, and then there was some part of that was Jackie, market. I, I, are we on the, are we on that bit yet? No, no, we've gone beyond it. No, we haven't got to it yet. Oh, I thought. It's my anyway, understanding. It's the next bit. Oh, OK. Well, anyway, sorry. I've been, so any, I've been looking at anyone else on performance indicators? Well, it was actually about that, really, because it was okay. actually what I was going to say was because people, other people have been raising things around our performance is in terms of enforcement. Um, the One of the part of the market housing that went forward on that site was there was a requirement to not have any lighting into the hedge bank, the wildlife corridor, and also that trees would be planted in the gardens of the market housing. And questions were raised at the time about how that could be managed. Well, what I want to need to report in is that I've been asked by a resident to look into the fact that there is external lighting on those houses. They are shining into the, the wildlife corridor. 
and the trees that were planted as part of their gardens have been felled. So there's only small saplings, but they've been taken out. So there's big, long grassy banks instead of what was meant to be a continuation of the wildlife corridor. And I, th- I just wondered, re- I just really needed to ask, how do we, how do we deal with that? Because it's, it seems to me that that's, that's something that's, it's gone into market private ownership. And are we out of our position, or does the enforcement, or, or does the planning requirement of that original planning that allowed those houses to be built still hold? And I've got a second question as well, but maybe that yeah, one first. I mean, I, that's an enforcement issue, isn't it, Jackie? I mean, you just need to get in touch with enforcement and then they'll take that forward. Um, uh, well, I don't know. That's what I was wondering, because is it somewhat, somewhat different now? It's because... a condition that they're not allowed to have external lights into the hedge and they've got them. Then that, then they're breaking their planning conditions and that's... And they'll okay, have to... Right. I'll, t- I'll take that. Okay. The I'm not sure about the tree, just... but I assume it's the same. I mean, when they have to plant trees, there's some caveat that says they've got to be there for a certain amount of time. Chairman, I I can probably answer that question. It's going to depend on the specific wording of either the condition or the the caveat, sorry, not the caveat, the covenant within the Section 106 agreement. And both conditions and and the Section 106 agreement will run with the land. So whether it's still in the ownership of the original um, applicant developer or whether it's now in private ownership the, the, the conditions run with the land so if they're in breach of the condition then we can take action against whoever okay. is the landowner that's, now. that's good so, that sounds like we can enforce on that jackie okay thank you and my second question was regarding um the loading up of comments on applications um, there's are, there are some applications now in dartington which are coming in with a lot of objections but the the planning uh, the planning committee and the parish council of, of the planning planning committee of the parish council they met specially on the 21st of january and their their views have not been loaded up yet and it's really quite important i think that they are so it's quite a long time and it just seems i mean is there an issue with with loading up is there an issue with admin in terms of our being able to deliver on our planning well the the, the fundamental issue is there there are a number of applications not just the the two or three in in Dartington, but there are a number of applications at the moment where we're getting a significant amount of correspondence um and it's the, the sheer it's the sheer volume of correspondence we're getting at the moment that, that means there's a little bit of a delay in getting them loaded up but we're getting them loaded up as 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 quickly as we can okay. um and my understanding is that they should be on so i've seen those emails my understanding is that from the case officer that the parish council comment should be online as of this morning they should have they should have gone on and then up gone on yesterday then updated overnight no they haven't i've just checked this while okay. we were talking now so i know just, i know something like, i just feel it, that it, parish councils maybe comments should perhaps be privatized because often they can be quite helpful in guidance for well, the public well, who are looking online but, but, but I, I'm, I'm aware that the, the case officer has got the parish council comments yeah but it's the public need to see them okay thank you right um any more on performance indicators um, no, I think I will move on to the next agenda item, which is the majors. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Um, um, again, as, as I said last um, last minute, chair, this this is a report that's going to be coming to you on um, every meet every meeting from now on in. I don't propose to go through these on an individual basis. We'll quite happily try and answer any questions, and if members have got any questions on specific applications that are on the list for the, the next agenda that's published. Uh, if you could um, let me know in advance, that, that I can definitely then find the answers for you, but I'll quite happily answer any questions that this is really just for information. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, Jackie, I think you wanted to ask a question. Hopefully it's something Pat can deal with, otherwise we'll deal with it, uh, deal with it later. No, we've done it, it's fine. Yeah, Thank okay, it's, it's all done, is it? Okay, thanks, thanks, Jackie. Um, Denise? Um, sorry, Pat, did you say you, you weren't dealing with individual uh, questions on individual uh, major applications? No, I could, I'll quite happily I will ha- quite happily deal with questions in terms of where we are in the progress of any application on this report. I, w- I yeah. certainly would not want to go have any conversations um, about individual enforcement um, cases because that wouldn't that wouldn't be a pro- that wouldn't be appropriate. And um, and we sh- um, we should not be discussing the merits or otherwise of these cases it's simply where they are in the um, in the workflow and where they are for progress because it'd be inappropriate at this stage for members to start discussing the merits of a case that may be, may well be coming to you for determination in the future 
Okay, can I ask on um, the uh, Roadport one then in Kingsbridge, 4158-19-FUR, yep. um, I see the um, applicant is reviewing the proposal, the applicant being Southam's District Council. Correct. Um, and what I'd like to know, if you know, Pat, is um, what stage this is at and what um, – <laughs> this is a community-led um, uh, housing application, just to remind the committee – um, what input will there be from the community, including myself and the other ward member, the town council and the wider community? Um, I, that, I don't that's think I be... can answer that, That because because the planning department will decide whether, you know, about on the planning application. The people who are, I don't know who, who's, who the individual officers are who are putting the application together, but they're the ones who are going to answer that. Yeah, I, my, uh, my, I think that question is probably best posed in an email to um, Laura Wooden. Yeah. To who, sorry? Laura Wooden. She's head of assets. Head of assets. Oh, right. Not, not the uh, planning officer. No, no, the planning no. officer. Because once, because, because what you're asking, you're asking questions about, um, uh, you know, how are they going to make it a community application? When process, it comes to the yeah. process, I mean, when it comes to us, we will decide whether we think it's passes, you know, fits in with our plan, with with planning, uh, you know, the, the MPPF and our local plan and all that. Nothing to do with, you know, community. That's that's a, that's a totally separate issue, really. OK, so it's the assets team. Yeah, yeah the, the, the applicants. it's basically the applicants. So th forget about it if it was South Hat, you know, it's the applicants. How are they going to? Um, it just happens to be Southampton District Council. How are they um, communicating with the community? Okay, thank you. Um, right, members, any more uh, on these? Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, what I'd like to do now is to formally close the meeting as is, and then we can shut down the recording. And then, if, Pat, if you wanted to make a few comments about staffing yep. issues... Um, which is absolutely correct that that should not be in the public domain. So, um, Vicky, can I? So, I'll formally close the meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you to members of the public. Um, and, Vicky, can I just confirm that we've now.